and good evening to all i am delighted to welcome everyone to the 6th day of the i humanities college summer school of literary theory and philosophy 2021 which is a joint initiative between university of wales trinity st david and the st berkman's college changanashiri kerala so today we have laura ride with us she is the founder of the discipline vegan studies she is professor of english at western carolina university in north carolina where she specializes in post colonial literatures and theory eco criticism and animal studies her monographs include writing out of all the camps jm kutsi's narratives of displacement then wilderness into civilized shapes reading the post colonial environment and the vegan studies project food animals and gender in the age of terror uh, actually her book the vegan studies project served as the foundational text for and an introduction to at the discipline of vegan studies then her edited collections include uh, through a vegan studies lens textual ethics and uh, lived activism published in 2019 and the rutledge handbook of vegan studies published recently in 2021 we are delighted to hear about animal studies and vegan studies from the expert itself um so thank you uh, professor laura right for this opportunity and um, now it's over to you for your talk thank you very much thank you very much for that introduction um and thank all of you uh for being here um today it's uh 9 o'clock in the morning in the united states where i am and i know it's 2 o'clock in the uk and i believe 6 o'clock in india so we are all over the place um I just want to basically talk about um sort of my background and I guess I wanted to trace sort of where I came from as a scholar to the current moment in um my society where we are kind of at a crossroads with regards to what we can discuss in higher education um we are we're in the midst of uh what is affectionately known as a culture war um around discussions of race um specifically so um i have a powerpoint which i hope that you will all be able to see i know some of you are going to be looking on your phones um before i put that on there i just i wanted to say that uh my my background is in um post colonial literatures specifically south african nigerian indian and caribbean literatures So th that was my training. Um my the majority of my work in graduate school was on a South African writer named JM Kutsia um who you may or may not be familiar with but um his work was sort of what turned me toward animal studies specifically a novel that he wrote called Disgrace and also um a series of lectures that he gave called The Lives of Animals. and um that kind of sh shifted me a little bit from you know just thinking about post colonial literature as dealing with human beings in conditions of um subjection but also to thinking about the ways that humans and animals are interconnected uh in terms of the ways that they are oppressed so that said let me just go ahead and pull up the slides and i'm hoping that you guys Wait a minute. Can you see that? I may have to share my screen. I'm not sure I shared it yet. Just a second. Okay. So let me yeah. see if this works. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Does that work for you? Yeah. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just move. Okay. Um so what I wanted to talk about first is uh I gave a series of of readings that I hoped that you would do before we talk today and um I'm not sure I, I kind of gave you a lot so <laughs> let me just talk a little bit about why I gave you those readings and then sort of go through uh my talk in terms of discussing um their importance or or what they can kind of tell us about uh this journey from animal studies to vegan studies um to the current moment so I gave you the first chapter of my monograph study the vegan studies project and i i wanted to just kind of talk about that briefly and say that i wrote that book 
um, kind of as, a, I don't want to say a joke, it wasn't a joke, but it was sort of a, um, in the spirit of kind of play, because I was really interested in the ways that people who identified as vegan were treated in the media, specifically in the United States. Um, so this was a real shift for me as a, as a scholar who really wasn't doing work on anything having to do with the United States to kind of think about what it is about the society that I live in that sort of vilify people who made the decision not to eat animals. So um, I did a really in-depth dive into my culture to try and figure out where that all came from. And the result was uh, the book, The Vegan Studies Project. Um, I, one of the, the texts that was kind of the impulse for that was an article by Harold Frum, who's actually a very renowned eco-critic. So he does environmental literary studies called Vegans in the Quest for Purity. Uh, that was in the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2010. And I have an excerpt from that in the slideshow that, that I'll read you to sort of show you what um, kind of what pushed me. It was a really angry uh, essay and I was sort of stunned by it. Uh, and it kind of was the, the defining moment for me where I was like, all right, I need to figure out what it is that comes from animal study scholars and eco-critics and these people who I think I align myself with that causes this kind of hostility. Um, more recently, an article in the New York Times by Ethan Varian called, it's, plant, it's called Plant-Based Look It Up. And this is an article I was really interested in because um, in terms of discussing diet and life um, and animals, animal rights, um, there's this real break between people who want to identify what they're doing as being vegan and people who are calling themselves plant-based as kind of um, this ethical delineator. So if you're plant-based, this doesn't mean that you have the same kind of um, investment in animals that people who um, claim to be ethically vegan do. So it's, it's, it's like a, a rhetorical trick that I think also is very gendered. Um, this came about, there was, a, there was a film last year or maybe a year before called The Game Changers that featured a lot of um, very famous men, very strong men, Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of them, who have gone plant-based. And they never use the word vegan because vegan has these interesting associations with femininity and with emotion. Um, so this, this kind of assertion of you know plant-based being something other than vegan, it means that you don't have to care about animals in the same way. Uh, then the last thing I gave you was something that happened um, Oh, that's actually supposed to be 2021, not 2020. Um, an article by a woman named Caitlin Richards, and she reached out to me for comment about um, a book that I had recently edited called The Rutledge Handbook of Vegan Studies. And um, she's writing for an organization called Campus Reform, which is a right-wing um, sort of journalism, uh, I don't exactly know what to call it, Basically, what they try to do is um, what we refer to as manufacture outrage about particular scholarly endeavors, particularly those that are theoretical, um, that are engaging with issues of <clears throat> race or gender or uh, queer theory or animal studies, anything that is, you know, potentially um, not uh, canonically um, acceptable. So she wrote this article um, and basically, I mean, you can see in the, in the title, she's got scare quotes, scare quotes around queer theory, anti-racism and eco-feminism. So the article was sort of written to generate outrage. It didn't, um, I'm very happy about that. I was a little worried that it was going to be one of those things that blew up on social media and then I was going to be harassed and um, in all the ways, but I was not. And then finally, um, Han Kang's short novel, uh, The Vegetarian, which is a novel that is South Korean, written in 2007. It was <clears throat> translated into English sometime later, but it's been a really interesting and kind of important novel in terms of thinking about some of the issues that uh, come up in animal studies, uh, post-colonial studies, feminist studies, and definitely vegan studies. So I, I wanted, um, before you know, looking into all of this, to sort of talk a little bit about the different kinds of schools of, of criticism and theory that I operate out of. And I'm 
this may be a little rudimentary to you all, and I apologize if it is, but I thought that, um, well, let me see if I can get, oh no, where's my next slide? Okay, there, <laughs> oops, I missed one. Okay, just to sort of discuss um, my, my intersecting um, theoretical disciplines. So the first one being post-colonial criticism, um, which is a field of study that kind of arose in the 1970s and gained a lot of uh, traction in the 1990s. So literally post-colonialism refers to the period following the decline of colonialism, the end or lessening of domination by European empires. Um, not specifically European, but that's generally the empires <clears throat> and, and the former colonies that we look at in terms of literature um, when we're talking about post-colonialism. Um, post-colonialism generally refers to the period after colonization. The distinction is not always made. Post-colonialism refers to a variety of critical approaches that examine literatures from formal, former colonies of European empires and their relationship to the rest of the world. So what I wanted to kind of think about, I'm gonna talk about all of these sort of theoretical modes um, in terms of the vegetarian, the novel, the short novel that, that you read. And I would argue, and there's, there's a lot of criticism out there about this novel as being a post-colonial novel um, written after Japan's control of, of the Korean empire, which ended during its surrender with World War II. So the novel is very much set in a post-colonial kind of space. Feminism, the next one. Uh, there are kind of three phases, I think, of, of the way that feminism has arisen in literary studies. Um, the first was to kind of go back and revive texts that were written by women. So examining the ways that literature has historically represented women um, through its kind of essentializing focus, going back and finding, um, uncovering literature written by women. Second, working to define or establish a feminist literary canon, um, reviving those works by women that have been discarded or undervalued, or theory seeking to reinterpret or revision literature from a less patriarchal position. And then the third one is uh, theories focusing on sexual difference and sexual politics, including gender studies, lesbian studies, cultural feminism, radical feminism, and socialist materialist feminism. Um, so I was thinking about, again, you know, the ways of reading a text like The Vegetarian. We can give it a post-colonial reading. Um, we can also give it a feminist reading. Um, and these two things, of course, are very much linked. So when Young Hai becomes a vegan, um, she rejects the norms that are dictated by her husband and her culture. Uh, she stops wearing a bra, she stops eating meat. Um, these things are very much associated with her society, but also with being um, a woman and the things that she's expected to do in terms of cooking for her family and um, doing what her husband tells her to do, which she completely stops. And then further by the end of the novel, her sister in high realizes ultimately that young Hay's transformation has liberated her from the bonds of marriage and motherhood. So it's through this really strange transform transformation that she goes through when she becomes a vegan. Um, and then the novel is called The Vegetarian, but um, this is you know, very much a novel that is about someone who doesn't eat any animals or animal products for that matter. Okay, and I wanted to also look at eco-criticism. Uh, this is from the introduction of the eco-criticism reader, which is edited by Cheryl Gottfelty and Harold Frum. So Frum is the person who wrote the really angry editorial about uh, vegans in the Chronicle of Higher Education. So this is, this is a really foundational text. It came out in 1996 um, when the field of eco-criticism was sort of being codified and defined. So eco-criticism is the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment. Um, and they compare it to um, feminist criticism that examines language and literature from a gender conscious perspective. Marxist criticism brings an awareness of the modes of production and economic class to its reading of texts. Eco-criticism takes an earth-centered approach to literary studies. Um, eco-criticism can be further characterized by distinguishing it from other critical approaches Literary theory in general examines the relations between writers, texts, and the world. In most literary theory, the world is synonymous with society, the social sphere. Eco-criticism expands the notion of the world to include the entire ecosphere. So, you know, eco-criticism, environmental reading, looking at text 
for what they tell us about the, the environment, about environmental harm. And in my um, second monograph, my, my first book that I wrote after graduate school was actually my dissertation on J.M. Kutsia, South African author. My second one, and I got really lucky, I, he won the Nobel Prize the year that I uh, actually finished my my dissertation and graduated. So I I kind of fell into getting a book published because everyone was suddenly interested in him. My second book was looking at the intersections between post-colonialism and eco-criticism and the ways that um, those two modes of thought had not really engaged um, too terribly much until maybe the second decade of the 2000s with each other. And since then, there's been a lot of work looking at the environmental consequences of post-colonial, of, of, of colonization specifically and the way that those things show up in literature. So within eco-criticism, there are several schools of uh, sort of positions within eco-criticism. So the, the first one is environmentalism. And I'm just gonna kind of gloss over these until I get to the one that I think is most important for vegan studies. So environmentalists are people who believe in the science and who care about the environment, but they're not really inclined to do a whole lot to, to change. Um, they, they join organizations like the Sierra Club, um, consider population growth to be a so-called third world problem. So this is a very Western perspective um, that uh, we recognize that things are bad, that we're hurting the environment, but we aren't really committed to doing much about it. And we tend to see environmental problems is happening elsewhere um, in places that are uh, that, that should be controlling things like population growth. Um, this is completely erroneous. If you live in the West, um, you should know that having a child and raising a child in the West is results in more consumption than just about anywhere else in the world, particularly in the United States. Uh, second position is deep ecology, and it is radical, also influential. The tenets of deep ecology are first that human and non-human life have intrinsic value. That is, non-human life matters in and of itself, not in terms of its relation to us. And second, that there is a need to, to be there that that there need to be fewer of us to sustain human and non-human life. Um, because of these positions, it's often considered misanthropic, that it's very anti-human um, and very pro the rest of the natural world. And finally, I don't think you can, you might not be able to see the top of the slide, but this is ecofeminism. Let me, let me shift my screen so I can actually see what I've written. Yes, okay, hang on just a second. Um, ecofeminism entails the recognition that the oppression of the earth is linked to the oppression of non-human animals, women, racial minorities, and other disenfranchised groups. So the, this is my sort of school of thought. Ecofeminists um, believe that in order to address one form of oppression, one needs to recognize the connection to other such forms. So this is kind of this idea that all oppressions are linked and that the natural world is as important as uh, the human world in order to fully deal with and engage with an, a kind of oppression in one area, there needs to be balance in all of them. Um, this ecofeminism came about in the 1970s and it gained popularity through the 1990s. And then it was sort of accused of being an essentializing way of thinking about things. Um, I have that down here. This way of thinking is often accused of being essentializing. That is to say, it suggests that women are essentially aligned with nature and men are aligned with culture. It isn't. Um, Ecofeminists seek an elevation of the othered aspect of the binary. So if you've got nature and culture, um, women and men, animals and human, colonized and colonizer, um, the, the, uh, the things that are on the disenfranchised side of that binary are the things that we tend to associate with each other. And what ecofeminism is asking is for an elevation of those things, um, not a recognition that they are inherent. So I hope that makes sense. And if there are questions about that, um, then please we can we can come back to um, come back to those. Absolutely. Whoops. Let me get back in here. Okay, so I, I have on here, I think this is, you know, another way of sort of reading 
this novel, um, reading the vegetarian as an ecofeminist narrative. Um, let me just grab this, hold on, I can read it. Uh, in the vegetarian, Young K dream, Young K's dreams may be about collective suffering, but I would argue that in addition to providing an allegorical reading of female Han, the novel positions this holism in a more ecofeminist space, allowing Young Hay's acts of dietary resistance to function not only as a response to the collective suffering of women under patriarchy, but also the suffering of non-human animals, as well as the, de the destruction of the natural world as ultimately evidenced in her desire to have flowers bloom from her crotch and her attempt, however unsuccessful, at the end of the novel to become a tree. So she's, you know, not only is this character not eating animals and animal products, she is, uh, oops, I'm sorry, let me get back. Oh no, there, okay. Sorry about that. Let me just get back to where I was. Uh, she's also very much wanting to be one with the earth and um, trying to become a tree by the end. Okay. So from there, I wanted to look just a little bit at animal studies, sort of talk about um, this, this field that I think of as being three-pronged in terms of the kinds of things that animal study scholars do. And I want to kind of preface that with saying that animal studies, that there's a, a moment in literary theory where we kind of recognize this thing called the animal turn in eco-critical theory. Uh, where people started to really focus on animals in specific ways. And so I have kind of a three-pronged way of thinking about animal studies in the humanities, in literary theory. The first is critical animal studies. The second is human animal studies. And the third is post-humanism. And um, by the way, I, I want to add that I am going to make sure to send this PowerPoint so that everyone who is here at the talk today can have it, because I, I realize I'm going through a lot of things very quickly, um, and I, I want to make sure that you know this information is is out there that you can look at at your leisure, and also get in touch with me if you have questions um, about any of the things that I'm saying as I kind of tear we'll, through. We'll, all. we'll put the PowerPoint on the WhatsApp. Um, we'll put the PowerPoint on the WhatsApp um, page for the participants. Oh, good. Okay. And I sent it to you. So um, you should have it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. Sure. That. Sure. Okay, so um, critical animal studies. So as a field, critical animal studies became codified with and after the publication of Peter Singer's very foundational animal liberation, which came out in 1975, as a quote, specialization within analytic philosophy, one that sets out to expose and to offer ethical responses to today's unprecedented subjection and exploitation of animals. So um, in that capacity, critical animal studies theorists consider issues of and distinctions between liberation, rights, and advocacy. Um, the utilitarianism that underscores Singer's account, uh, and, and this is you know, a big difference between uh, the other very foundational um, sort of animal studies philosopher, Tom Regan, who wrote uh, in 1983, The Case for Animal Rights. Regan asserts that determining who or what is deserving of rights should not be dependent on the consequences or the utility of a given action. So uh, this is kind of where all of that started. Um, I have on here, the vegetarian, I sort of wanted to look at that in terms of, of critical animal studies, thinking about why, uh, this character of Young Hay decides to stop eating meat. And we never get a really clear kind of reason for, for why. Um, she has these dreams and we get those in the first part of the novel. So I wanted to read this, um, this, this section. And this is from an essay that I've written about this particular book. Uh, the reasons for her rejection of meat and dairy are elusive even as she has, she has recurrent dreams of trying to escape meat and blood of animal eyes gleaming wild, presence of blood, unearthed skull, again those eyes. She acknowledges, I ate too much meat. The lives of the animals I ate have all lodged there, blood and flesh. All those butchered bodies are scattered in every nook and cranny. These dreams indicate a rejection of the cruelty of slaughter and abuse. Um, her father's torture of not only a dog that bit Ying, Young Hay, but of Young Hay herself. Her sister's later recollection that her father abused Young Hay 
as well as Young Hae's husband's narrative of his father's father-in-law hitting her after she becomes vegetarian during a family dinner turn intervention, indicates a rejection of the patriarchal control of the men in her life who insist upon her consumption of animal flesh, as well as a rejection of a culture in which women have historically had limited agency. The fact that Young Hae never narrates and refuses to give a reason for her veganism, other than saying it's because of a dream I had, forces the reader to accept the rationale of the dream, that her veganism is the result of a recognition of meeting the gaze of the animal eyes and being unable to look away thereafter. Okay, uh, second, so that's critical animal studies. Post-humanism um, sort of evolved after critical animal studies. It's a position that comes both before and after humanism and it constitutes the most recent theoretical foray into the field of animal studies. It takes into account both critical animal studies and human animal studies, and its impulse to situate our understanding of species in a space that challenges our conception of what it means to be human. Um, so a couple of the really foundational voices in the field of posthumanism, Carrie Wolf, who I mentioned at the top of the, the, this passage, and then Donna Haraway, who's When Species Meet is a very foundational text in posthumanism. <clears throat> the, the first section of her book is titled, We Have Never Been Human. Uh, to support this assertion, I think it's a really cool argument. I'm not sure I agree with it. Haraway notes that the human genome is found in only about 10% of all the cells that make up the human body. She says the other 90% are filled with genomes of bacteria, fungi, protists, and such, some of which play in a symphony necessary to my being alive at all, and some of which are hitching a ride and doing the rest of me, of us, no harm. To be one is always to become with many. So this idea that <clears throat> there's ever anything that is authentically human is complicated because we are enmeshed with all sorts of other entities and um, microscope, microbes and, and various other things. Um, she also, you know, says that she writes a lot about companion animals and the way that our DNA, particularly in the United States and in the Western world, is very much caught up with the DNA of the, of the dogs that we have as pets in our homes, um, that we are completely enmeshed in that way. So post-humanism, kind of an interesting thing, trying to figure out, um, you know, what it means to be human or if we ever have been fully human. Another interesting kind of component of this is to think about the technology that makes up everything we do from the running shoes that we wear or the glasses that we read that we need to be able to see. Um, all of these things are part of us, but they are also part of what makes us machines, um, cyborg, cyborgs in, in Donna Haraway's terminology. Okay, and then last but not least, I have human animal studies on here, which is something kind of different. Human animal studies constitutes an interdisciplinary field that explores, explores according to Margot DeMillo, the spaces that animal occupy, animals occupy in human social and cultural worlds and the intersections humans have with animals. So <clears throat> this is a field that emerged in the 1990s. It's not invested in overtly challenging the human animal binary, but in examining how humans and animals negotiate relationships across the, that boundary. So um, this, this particular area, you know, uh, scholars work in a lot of different fields, social sciences, humanities, national, natural sciences. Um, the field arose out of an interest in, in animal imbrication in human society. Therefore, even though human animal studies may have real world policy implications, and in fact give rise to the animal protection movement, it is not a means of advocating for animals. So I hope that kind of those three things sort of shed light on <clears throat> this really complex uh, thing that is animal studies, uh, the critical animal studies that's very invested in engaging with animal rights and liberation, um, post-humanism, which is maybe more interested in what constitutes being human and then human animal studies, which is more concerned with the ways that we relate with non-human animals. Okay, so then I wanna go from there <clears throat> to veganism and vegan studies, because that's where I ended up. Um, so to be vegan, according to a memorandum 
of the Association of the Vegan Society is to ascribe to a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practicable. And that's a really important part of this. As far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose, and by extension, promotes the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefits of humans, animals, and the environment. In dietary terms, it denotes the practice of dispensing with all products derived wholly or partly from animals. So I want to just say, <clears throat> you know, vegans get this sort of extremist bad name a lot of times. Uh, we're very easy to make fun of. Uh, we show up in the media all the time as sort of the, the subject of, of jokes and, um, you know, derision. But I want to point out, and I think this is something that maybe gets overlooked, that the vegan society, their definition is that we should do these things as far as is possible and practicable. It's not a mandate that we must do things that are impossible, um, that are not practical, that are going to be more harmful to us. So it is, um, I think what a lot of scholars have, have come to conclude is that veganism is aspirational and not necessarily um, something that is always concrete, always set in stone. Okay, so there's my book. Um, I always put in a plug for it. And uh, like I said, I wrote this book as a result of kind of looking at the ways that vegans were depicted in the media, the ways that we were criticized. And um, it kind of, it, it's sort of interesting. I wrote it in 2015 and I, I thought I was doing something that no one else was really doing. And <clears throat> to some extent that's true, but also at about that time, there are a lot of people in animal studies specifically grappling with what we do with vegans. <laughs> So um, a lot of critical animal studies scholars are not vegan. And there was a lot of push for them to, you know, change and to become vegan. And there was a lot of debate within the field of critical animal studies and animal studies more broadly about what veganism's place within that field was. So in some sense, I thought maybe if we take veganism out and do something separate with it, um, there's a way of kind of considering its, its engagement with uh, animal studies. So there happened to be kind of a confluence, um, I would say a, a zeitgeist moment where scholars were really doing a lot of the similar work. And so when I, when I published the book and called it the Vegan Studies Project, I didn't really have any idea that it was going to become the sort of text of what has become vegan studies, um, whether or not vegan studies is a real thing is, is also up for debate. I know some people think it isn't, that it's just um, an outcrop of animal studies. Um, but I, okay, so in writing the book, just to go back in, <clears throat> I think of veganism as both identity and practice. So veganism constitutes both an identi identity category, like those that constitute race, sexual orientation, national orientation, and religion, for example as well as a practice dependent upon the eschewing of all animal products from num numerous aspects of one's life. And being vegan no matter where and when has always constituted a non-normative position, one that has often inspired persecution. So um, veganism as an identity category is problematic uh, no matter where it is being asserted. And um, that has been the case throughout history uh, around the world. And I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to share, this is another one of those things that sort of got me wanting to write about veganism. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how many people know Anthony Bourdain. I, I have really no idea how um, well-known he is outside of the United States, but he was a very big deal in the United States. He's a chef, former chef who wrote a book called Kitchen Confidential in 2000. And I, in my book, I, I was very interested in looking at what people were eating in the United States before September 11th, which was this kind of turning point moment in our society where all kinds of things um, changed in the way that we perceived other people, um, including the things that, we, that they ate. 
Um, there had been in the 1990s sort of an embrace of vegetarian diets and, and diets that people thought of as perhaps ethnic, not American, and vegetarianism and veganism uh, very much associated with non-American diets. So Anthony Bourdain writes this book, and in it, he makes this statement, <coughs> excuse me, and of course, this is, this is just before September 11th vegetarians and their Hezbollah-like splinter faction, the vegans, are a persistent irritant to any chef worth a damn. Vegetarians are the enemy of everything good and decent in the human spirit and affront to all I stand for, the pure enjoyment of food. Um, so I was, I was really like astounded at the comparison of, you know, a dietary choice that's very much about not causing harm, um, its association with Hezbollah um, seemed to me a, a really kind of profound statement. Um, Bourdain committed suicide in June of 2018. And there's a recent documentary, I think that's out on Netflix right now about him that I haven't really brought myself to watch, but I might um, just because I'm, I find him sort of fascinating and also very problematic. Okay, so this is the, this is the passage from The Herald from Peace, Vegans in the Quest for Purity that really got me wanting to write about veganism. <clears throat> and I feel like I'm losing my voice. Hang on, let me get some water really quickly. <clears throat> the way that I teach is much more um, of a conversation. So to lecture like this is, is uh, very different and kind of hard for me. So please bear with me. I'm really looking forward to the question and answer portion of, of this discussion. Uh, so this is Harold Froome, and I, I still can't figure out why he did this, but he wrote this, this piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and he says, the grandstanding of vegans for carefully selected life forms to serve their own sensitivities through their meat and dairy-free diets, their avoidance of leather and other animal products doesn't do produce much besides a sense of their own virtue. As they make their footprints smaller and smaller, will they soon be walking on their toes like ballet dancers? And if so, what is the step after that? Pure spirit, a euphemism for bodily death? If our existence is the problem, which it is, then only non-existence can cure it. The Supreme Biocentric Act is not to discover yet one more animal product to abstain from. The Supreme Biocentric Act is dying, returning the finite matter and energy you have appropriated for yourself and giving them back to the creatures you stole them from. And what makes them so pure? Are they shedding tears as they tear you and each other apart? The real crime is existence, not being or using animals. <clears throat> so I have a lot that I could say about this, but my main point I think is, is something that uh, vegans deal with a lot, which is this sort of really weird argument that if you are vegan, you may as well give up because you're not doing all of these other things. You, you, can't, you can't solve the problem, so why even bother? If, if you are not eating animals, you're still you know, walking on the ground and, and crushing bugs under your feet, for example. The only solution you have is to die and stop taking up space. So it's a real cop-out of an argument, I think, um, you know, that if you can't do everything, you shouldn't do anything. Uh, everyone makes choices about the things that they are going to do um, in an attempt to live a better life, whatever that might mean for whoever is making that decision. But like I said, veganism uh, results in this, this really sort of strong outrage with regard to, you know, this kind of thinking. Um, I actually contacted, <clears throat> well, actually, I didn't contact him. I take that back. When the book came out, he contacted me. Um, which was sort of shocking and told me that he had given, he had written this piece for the Chronicle and then he, the Chronicle had edited it, and edited it in such a way that he was taken completely out of context. So I followed up with him and thanked him for his, um, his contacting me and I really appreciated it, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I understand how something like this could have been taken out of context. But anyway, um, it apparently struck a nerve that I was writing about it. So here we are. Okay, so just kind of to think about, um, I have a few more things I wanna say 
before we we take a break um, and and you know go away and then come back and have a discussion in terms of the vegetarian how does young hayes veganism function in the context of this novel i'm i'm curious because i think it's a really problematic novel she's about to die by the end she stopped eating is it a manifestation of madness is she insane is it a rejection of her culture a rejection of patriarchy is it an eating disorder um, she's, you know, pretty much stopped eating altogether and is starving. Um, or is it a form of liberation? Is she doing exactly what Harold Frome was, you know, sort of criticizing vegans for not doing? She's giving up and dying. Um, okay, uh, so think about that. Um, I wanted just to sort of think about the ways that vegan studies, if we are thinking about the world as text that could be read through the lens of veganism, what sort of texts we might read. And so I had just a few that I wanted to share. Um, and the last one I think is maybe the most kind of difficult. Um, Casey Affleck was in a movie called Manchester by the Sea that came out a few years ago. And uh, Casey Affleck it, is problematic in a lot of ways, um, but he is an ethical vegan. And one of the things that he did in that movie was to put uh, Gardein <laughs> products in the freezer of um, the, in the movie. There's, there's this scene where um, one of the characters goes to the freezer to get something to eat and opens up their freezer and there are these vegetarian, vegan, plant-based meats all in the side of the refrigerator, very clear for the audience to see. And I think this is a really, it's an interesting scene because what's happened is that the brother of the character that Affleck is playing has died. And he's in Massachusetts, which is a very, very cold part of the United States. He dies in the winter and his body has to be frozen and saved until spring when the ground thaws to be buried. <clears throat> so his son is uh, being cared for by Casey Affleck's character, who is his uncle. His son goes to open the refrigerator to get something to eat the freezer. And we see the vegetarian meat um, and then the camera turns and the freezer is full of, of meat, actual meat. Um, the son has kind of a breakdown in that moment. And it's really clear that he's having this association with the frozen animals, frozen animal bodies in his freezer and the frozen body of his father. So, this insertion of the vegan meat, the Gardein meat into that scene is, was for me as a vegan, a really powerful moment. Um, anyway, so that's one, that's one thing. Uh, the next thing is, um, and I don't really want to talk about Trump anymore, but just briefly, um, he was really interesting as a subject when I was doing work on vegan studies and the way that this country and the Republican party in this country has weaponized meat um, against the left who they are claiming want to come not only for everyone's guns, but for their hamburgers um, that we're, we're trying to get rid of cows in order to stop global warming. Um, so he, yeah, anyway, I just, this image of him with uh, these Trump steaks um, is, is kind of a, a thing. And I wanted to actually read this is this is the last sort of real thing that I have, but I wanted to to read a bit from a book called Through a Vegan Studies Lens, which is a collection um, of essays. The my essay in it is about this particular image, and um, I'm just going to read. Hopefully, I won't read too much, but um, just to kind of talk about what's going on here. So on August 27th, 2015, police discovered the bodies of 71 people from Syria, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan locked in a truck on the side of the highway in Australia. Simon Tomlinson and Darren Boyle report, reported, quote, many of the bodies had decomposed, suggesting they had been for, dead for several days in the back of an airtight refrigerated lorry that usually carried frozen chicken. And the, image in the images of the truck, which was formerly owned by Haiza, a Slovia, Slo, Slovakian chicken company, appeared in print and online. 
Beside the truck, which is covered in images of Haiza products, people in hazmat suits prepared to open the back doors, upon one of which appears a photographic image of a chicken's head with eyes seemingly staring directly at the lock. This image is not, on, not the only one on the truck that depicts, a, oh, sorry, this image is the only one on the truck that depicts a living animal and not the meat made after it is killed. In the news coverage that followed the discovery, the people who died in the truck were referred to almost interchangeably as migrants or refugees, sometimes even in the same article. For example, in a May 4th, 2017 article in the New York Times called Hungary, um, titled Hungary Indicts 11 in Truck Suffocation Deaths of 71 Refugees, Allison Smiles says, the, direct, the discovery of the bodies in the truck in the sweltering heat became a turning point in the European Union's disorganized response to the waves of migrants flooding into the continent to escape war and deprivation in the Middle East and elsewhere. So I just wanna note that the distinction between migrant and refugee may seem minor, but it is nonetheless has rhetorical consequences in terms of how readers view the people who died. The assumption is that migrants choose to leave their homeland for another while refugees are forced to leave in order to flee violence, starvation or other horrific circumstances that endanger their lives. And increasingly the rhetoric of immigration reform for many Western countries, including the US and those of the EU has focused on curbing immigration by associating immigrants with crime. Uh, for example, during his 2016 presidential campaign, Donald Trump referred to Mexican immigrants as rapists and criminals. And his various attempts at a so-called Muslim ban restricted entry into the US by citizens of six predominantly Muslim countries, including Syria. <clears throat> Further, one of the main reasons that British citizens voted to leave the EU was because of immig immigration. Um, and I, I have some quotes in here without going into a whole lot of detail. I was going to read a quote from Trump <clears throat> from a rally in Ohio that he gave, and I believe this was before he was elected, where he refers to immigrants not only as criminals, but also as animals. And he says, as you've seen the stories about some of these animals, they don't want to use guns because it's too fast and it's not painful enough. They'll take a young, beautiful girl, 16, 15 and up, and others, and they slice them and dice them with a knife because they want them to go through excruciating pain before they die. And these are the animals that we've been protecting for so long. Well, they're not being protected any longer, folks. Um, Trump clearly thinks that animals are of le less ethical concern than humans. Um, he was the first American, modern American president not to have a pet. And one of his favorite go-to expressions when angered by a woman is to call her a dog. So, just kind of really quickly, and then I'll kind of move on from this. The three rhetorical moves that take us from individual person to homogenizing immigrant, to criminal, to animal, work to remove personhood and humanity from the humans who are seeking asylum. The effective erasure of the term refugee serves to situate all migr migrants as immigrants, people leaving their homeland by choice. So it's this interesting kind of rhetorical slippage that occurs when um, you know we have we have this discussion of migrants as or I'm sorry refugees as migrants as criminals as animals um, for them to then end up in the back of a truck that carries dead animals um, meat um, and for them to die there seems particularly um, significant. So I'm just going to read this one last paragraph. Um, the image of the unopened truck makes manifest the horror of treating humans like non-human animals that are rendered absent in order to become meat. But a vegan studies reading requires that we recognize in that image that the animals killed and processed by the Heizio Meat Company were individual beings as well, beings who suffered, were commodified, and then made absent. The face of the lone chicken on the truck, watching as investigators prepare to unpack the human cargo within, displaced by war, brought on in part by climate change, is an entreaty, a plea to be seen, to have those who unlock the door also look the animal in the eye, even in the moment before they face the horror within. And a vegan reading requires that we see the enmeshed oppressions of the land, the animals, and the people as necessarily inherently linked and mutually reinforcing. Okay, so I will um, just one last 
slide. I'll stop with that. But I did want to just, I wanted to bring up sort of um, the, the dangers of theory, the dangers of uh, doing work in, in realms like uh, critical race theory or uh, gender studies, queer theory, um, vegan theory. Um, obviously now I've, I've been a target uh, on, you know, for the, the work that I'm doing to sort of make these connections. At present in the United States, we have this war against critical race theory, um, which is, is not really being discussed for what critical race theory is, um, but rather being used as kind of a catch-all to make people um, think that any discussion of race in any classroom is um, you know, something that is dangerous, that is gonna make people feel bad, that is teaching us a hatred for our country. And um, some states in the United States have already started requiring um, even college professors to discuss what courses they teach and what the content of those courses are. Um, I live in a state called North Carolina and um, this is already kind of happening here. So I just, it's very much something that's on my mind right now and maybe not so much connected to vegan studies and animal studies, but still um, connected to work that is connecting um, oppressions and, and bringing them to light and talking about these things. So I guess maybe that's, is that enough? That's, that's probably enough. I'm a little bit shy of uh, the complete hour mark, but um, I think if it's okay, I will just stop there.